Thanks, Guy and Lori, for organizing this and putting this together. And it's great to see um, people on the call here, lots of familiar faces, people I've walked with uh, uh, locally and in Spain. So that's that's really wonderful for me. Uh, I want to thank everyone for um, lis listening to this. Uh, really, as Guy said, it's a preview of what I'm planning to present at the gathering at the end of this month. And um, I'm doing it in a slightly different format because it's Zoom, so I won't be doing some of the um, video effects and audio effects and things like that just to facilitate Zoom. But um, also just kind of wanted to put it out there that this is um, a little bit outside my comfort zone for me on, on multiple levels. Uh, I'm not really a natural storyteller and I'm certainly not an artist <laughs> per se. Um, so uh, for me to do this is really a stretch. Um, feeling a little bit vulnerable, but it's great to do it in front of a friendly audience here. And so I, I really appreciate your time on this. And so, you know, grab a glass of wine or whatever and uh, um, come along. So let me go ahead and share. Okay. So as, as Guy mentioned, um, the title of my presentation is Walking the Inward Road. And I guess just to give a little bit more background on what got me to this inward road is, as Guy mentioned, I did my Camino, uh, the Camino Frances in 2018, um, had a, you know, I don't even know the right word to describe it, but just a, you know, incredible experience, transformative experience. Um, I came back and, uh, I remember just kind of the difficulty in trying to communicate to people, um, what the experience was all about, all about. Uh, I found that the conventional conversation focused on things like how many miles did I walk? How many days did you walk? Did you get blisters? Whatever. And it really, there was, there was something much more deep that I wanted to communicate, but it was very difficult. Uh, when November came around after I got back and we had our welcome home ceremony for the chapter here, I uh, was looking forward to getting together with the group, fellow pilgrims. And I remember they offered time for people to come up and share a story or some words or whatever. And I was super excited about that. I had a couple of different stories I was ready to share. But when the time came, I was just really just so emotional. I didn't think I could get up there without <clears throat> um, getting all flustered. Um, so it was like the experience was so raw for me. There was really something um, I needed to express and, and couldn't. And so then I started looking forward to next year. I really wanted to do uh, another Camino in 2019 um, due to various issues, including a new set of wildfires in Sonoma County. Uh, I put that on hold. And then looking forward to 2020, I said, okay, I'm going to beat this fire thing. I'm going to go in the spring of 2020, but of course we know what happened in 2020. So I, I think an alternative name for this presentation could have been how, how did I spend the pandemic? Uh, because basically what I did is I chose the time of the pandemic to go back through my Camino, especially looking through my photos and such and trying to reprocess that. And so um, that's really where the term walking the inward road comes from. I think we've heard a lot recently about how the Camino doesn't necessarily end at Santiago. In fact, some people are saying it may begin on your way home and where you, where you process things. And I've always loved the story that, you know, traditional pilgrims from hundreds of years ago didn't go to Santiago, then take a jet home. They had to walk home. And that was really an opportunity for them to think about the pilgrimage and what they had done. So in a way, this is my attempt to, to go through that. So um, just to explain a little bit more, the inward road, um, Thomas Merton was this uh, American monk, and he said that the uh, geographic pilgrim, pilgrimage is symbolic of acting out of an inner journey. And the inner journey is the interpolation of meanings and signs of the outer pilgrimage. So there's a geographic pilgrimage and the inner journey or inward road. And he said one could have one without the other. It is best to have both. So... I think that's an interesting observation and, and point of view. And in terms of what I'm going to share with you today, it's not going to be your typical travel log. 
And here I threw together what's going to be the most conventional map you're going to see today. And uh, I intentionally did this very vague and, and blurry uh, because really the way I looked at my Camino wasn't like day one, I did this, day 10, I did this, day 15, I did this. The whole experience was just so powerful that the days and places and people all just kind of blurred together into this wonderful mosaic and fabric. And so these are some of the key places that I'll be talking about here. You can see on the, um, on the uh, Camino Frances, so starting in the Pyrenees with the Route Napoleon, going to uh, Puente de la Reina, Via Tuerta, Grañón, Cruz de Cerro, Via Franco del Bierzo, and Vilar de Donas. So again, the names are inconsequential, but just to give you sort of a conventional time frame. When I started processing the Camino, I started doing things a little bit differently. I started focusing on themes. So even when I was walking, I focused on themes like, you know, taking pictures of my shadow, of my boots. I also was obsessed with things like um, the haystacks in the fields, um, doors, uh, plants, various things. And again, it wasn't about the sequential sequence of those. It was more about just the theme of them and how they played together. So this is one of the first things I put together that was um, a little conventional, but I think really good in terms of looking at things in different terms of space and time. So, uh, you know, the, the shadows that we all saw every morning, the long shadows and short shadows walking west, and then also our boots as we walked along, uh, different pavements, different places. And what I found as I was starting to process my own Camino is that I wanted to map out something in my mind that was different than the traditional map itself. And I had all these different stories and things that I wanted to convey. And all of a sudden it got very overwhelming. And I was like, I don't have time to do this all, but I want to remember this idea. I want to remember this theme. And so, um, one of my kind of fetishes or hobbies is, is maps. I collect maps, both realistic maps, uh, creative maps, fantasy maps. And so I started putting together my own map in terms of what my inner Camino looked like. And here you can see what I did is that sort of broke my world into two different hemispheres. Uh, one is the conditioned self. So if you have followed anything on the hero's journey, you know what some of these terms mean. So the conditioned self is sort of the ordinary world. And then the authentic self is a thing that we try to find, especially on the Camino. Some of us do that. And then splitting it right down the middle is the liminal. Uh, which was a, a word that I learned during the last couple of years and, and got to know very well. And so the Rio Liminal is the, uh, the split between these two different realms. And so basically what I had here was sort of the conventional world that got me started. And then as I went into my Camino, what were the different themes that came about? And <laughs> what you'll see here is that I'm, I'm really, um, I don't want to say obsessed, but um, influenced or perhaps a victim of of pop music. Um, as a kid, um, my mother was really into music. I listened to music a lot, seventies pop. And when I walk around, especially on the, the Camino on a trail, different songs pop into my head and they trigger different memories and thoughts. And so a lot of the themes that I, um, will present are influenced by pop songs. Um, but, uh, so, so this was sort of the, um, the journey that I want was on, but I can zoom in a little bit and focus on some of these different areas. You can see, uh, the road of trials is the first thing on the, um, uh, the hero's journey that you'll run into, you know, you need to be confronted with a challenge. And I know all of us have different challenges. We confront when we go on our Camino, some of us do it for athleticism, for a walk. Some of us do it because we're, uh, trying to process a loss or grief or a change in our lives. But anyway, road of trials, I think is something many people encounter on the Camino. Uh, but then I, you know, had different themes that I wanted to focus on. Um, and some of these were influenced also by, by poets. Um, David Wyatt, I don't know if um, many of you are familiar with him, but another sort of Camino um, uh, stable out there, but he's a 
English poet here in the U.S., but very Kamina oriented. And I got a lot of uh, influence and comfort from him actually during the pandemic as well. So this is the, the upper part and here's just uh, the lower part as well. So some of these stories I'll be going through will we'll focus on some of these different things in the map. So moving on, um, first thing I wanted to cover was sort of how um, I looked at these different places. And what I found is that an interesting thing was as I was able to contemplate things on the Camino, it wasn't like I was discovering new things. It was like I was uncovering forgotten ideas or forgotten places. And so I used the term uh, avia una vez, which in Spanish means once upon a time. And that became sort of the, um, the mosaic of the Camino experience for me. And so here I have another quote about uh, beyond the physical journey is the imagined journey, whether it's through manuscripts, maps, art, labyrinths, et cetera. Pilgrim's experience can literally be brought home for others to experience. So that is something that I started looking at when I first started this project. And what I did is I took sort of a, a, a mosaic of different things on the Camino, because that's really how I looked at it. I didn't say day 15, I was here, day 20, I was here. So here you see sort of my representation of the Camino. Some of the, the monuments, you can see the, the Camino marker, uh, the uh, Alto del Padron, uh, Puente de la Reina, and um, the uh, Cruz de Ferro, along with the you know, typical walk through the fields. And so this is something that I developed using some of my photographs, transformed them, and uh, came together with this composite. And this just became very pleasing and healing for me to, to, to see this. And sort of the more vague the photo or the image, uh, the more real it became to me in my mind and imagination. Uh, this is another version of this. So again, just kind of blurring it up a bit with a bit of wa watercolor effect. But again, just uh, very comforting for me just uh, to visualize this as the image of the Camino itself. So the other thing that I mentioned that was important was the, the concept of liminal. And uh, I've always known what subliminal was, but never thought about liminal itself. But it's really basically about uh, defining a borderline between two different areas. And it's often used to talk about when people are moving between two different stages of their life, um, basically transformational. And so this became very important to me in terms of looking at the Camino itself. And the next thing, the next couple of things I'm gonna share with you, I'm gonna call uh, liminal selfies. So basically at this point, I started looking at the Camino and myself as being kind of wanted together. I, I thought about the day-to-day -day rhythm of the Camino, day and night, just, you know, the, the whole rhythm of the Camino was just really powerful in terms of um, you wake up, you get dressed, you walk, you eat, you walk, you eat again, and you find a place to sleep, you do your laundry, you sleep, do it again. And that was so, such a comforting thing to have that kind of clarity with that rhythm, but also the rhythm of the days, the seasons, uh, and nature itself. And so all of those things are very important from a liminal perspective. So these are what I call my liminal selfies. Um, so I took some of the photos and did um, sort of double exposure effects to kind of, again, blur that tight relationship between myself and the different components. And, um, you know, here's one with me and, and the cathedral itself. Um, and this is actually interesting for me because those of you who know me know I, I don't like being photographed and I certainly don't like looking at my own picture, <laughs> but in this process, I actually became comfortable with it. Um, it just was some sort of, um, uh, catharsis or revelation to be able to, to do that. Um, this is one that, um, I called bridging the liminal, basically the Puente de la Reina, and then putting myself into that. 
and um, this one is just pretty, pretty meaningful for me. Um, I like this a lot. And then just, just other ways playing around with this, um, myself with the cathedral in the background, and then um, also something that's, you know, uh, very different with all my, my hands, my arms, um, things like this. Uh, again, sort of the, the body being part of the Camino, um, you know, you can't walk the Camino without engaging your body. So really being grateful for what my body was able to do and being able to look at the different experiences through that image of the body was very powerful for me. So the, the next chapter, so to speak, um, again, influenced by pop rock song, plants and birds and rocks and things. Um, on the first part of the journey, I was looking at all the life. There are plants and birds and rocks and things, sand and hills and rings. And that was probably the most powerful thing when I first started the Camino out of St. John was just the beauty of nature. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm, it's not like I, I live in the city. I'm never exposed to nature. I'm here in Sonoma County. So we see lots of nature, but just, I was really just so overwhelmed by the beauty of the landscape, walking over the Pyrenees, uh, the way the animals um, seem to live in balance with the people there. It's just wonderful. And what I'm showing you here is a, an image of what I think is a crocus, which I remember seeing walking down into Roncesvalles. And for me, being from California, California native, I've only seen crocuses planted, you know, from bulbs. I hear that they grow naturally other places. But to see these things um, coming out of the ground all along the Camino was just really powerful for me. And also just because they, they're so delicate and beautiful, but they would seem to pop out in the most hostile environments, places that were dry, places that were just, you know, in the sun, but they just popped out. And I'm not sure how long they stayed as a flower, but it was just a, a beautiful thing. So before going to my authentic self, Here's just the traditional photos. So these are some of the things that just really impressed me. You know, the, uh, the beauty of the flowers, the beauty of the, the, the horses, uh, the animals. And what I did was take those images and basically kind of look at them through, I want to say blurred eyes. So, you know, sometimes if you're trying to see something, you might cross your eyes a little bit or, or look up. And I guess that is how I pictured sort of the beauty of nature with this. Um, you know, photos are certainly beautiful in itself, but for me, just kind of having this, this blurry view of the world, perhaps with, you know, dew covering the lens of your camera is perhaps the effect here, uh, was really, um, wonderful for me. And so I, I played around with this effect a bit. Um, and so here's, you know, some of the, the horses across the Pyrenees, um, just, you know, beautiful relationship between them, assuming mother and, and, um, son or daughter, whatever, uh, but just the, the beauty of nature there. And again, just the, the way that, you know, the animals existed with the, the people along the Camino was just, just wonderful there. So for this next section, um, it's all about what I call castles. And, uh, for me, just in kind of my American arrogance, three castles, anything that's made out of stone and old, um, in my mind, I've always, when I've traveled to Spain, I've always been in awe of, of older buildings, walking around the Gothic quarter in Barcelona. I love to touch the stone thinking how many people have walked by here in the past. Um, so really the sense of history associated with that. And there are three, um, castles or buildings here that I, I focused on, uh, one, um, was towards the beginning of the Camino, uh, Ermita de San Miguel, uh, near Via Tuerta. Uh, so this was a very old structure, uh, I believe built in the 10th century. So just maybe a hundred years or so after the Camino, uh, was started. Uh, then there's the, uh, Iglesia de Santiago in, um, in Lyon area. And this is an interesting church because they actually have a uh, Puerta de Perdón. So this is a church where if the pilgrims couldn't make it all the way to Santiago, 
if they went through this door, they would have uh, their sins absolved as well. And so nowadays they open that door to the church the same year as the Holy Year in Santiago. So the same sort of thing there. And then the last one is in Galicia. It's um, uh, Iglesia de San Salvador in Vilar de Donas. And this is a, a ancient church uh, originally started as a nunnery, but then uh, taken over to serve the Knights of the Templar. So some, some strong Camino influences there. And it's not right on the Camino. I, I went off the Camino, I think five or six kilometers to, to get there, but certainly worth the trip. So what does this have to do with anything here? <laughs> so um, when I was in high school and studied French, uh, I, I learned the term Chateau de Chateau in España, uh, which means castles in Spain. Um, in English, we have the term castles in the sand. And when I was walking with one of my Camino Amigas, I asked, well, how do you say this in Spain? And they said, in Spain, they say castillos en el aire, so castles in the air. And so what does this, what does this mean? This is used as a term for, um, for instance, castles of sand are beautiful things that are destined to end. So things that are intangible, so pipe dreams, something impossible to realize. And again, it called to mind one of my um, songs. Um, and so really it's about sort of the, the, the temporal, ephemeral nature of things that we can't really hold on to things forever, that they're, even if they're beautiful, they're destined to end in one way or another. And that seemed to apply to many of the different lessons that I was going through walking the Camino. And what I did is I sort of took those images and put them into that, that landscape. So here is that a uh, first uh, ermita uh, put in the uh, ocean. And I guess what this means to me is, is that, you know, the, the Camino will persist despite what happens, despite politics, history, plagues, viruses, things are gonna persist. And so this, this was one of the first images I did in the series and I just, you know, not really the best technically, but just really um, meaningful to me from that perspective. Um, another one I did was a church that we just talked about, the Iglesia de Santiago. And so this is really the uh, Castillo San El Are. So putting the castle in the sky, and that seemed appropriate for that particular church. Uh, although I did not know it when I first did the image, I researched the history of it afterwards. Uh, here's just a more detailed version of it. And then this is the um, uh, Iglesia um, de San Salvador in Vilar de Donas. And again, the idea of uh, the ocean coming in. And as I did these, I realized that this uh, coincided with an a important theme that I had was just when walking the Camino, sort of being very concerned and sad about the environment, about extinctions, about climate change. And so to see, you know, these, these monuments in the context of perhaps changing sea levels and things like that um, worked for me well also. Another thing too was um, sort of the idea of abundance. And there's several different symbols on the Camino for abundance. One is the Guerrero. Um, not sure if I'm uh, trying to remember if I'm saying that uh, correctly, uh, but basically the Galician uh, grain storage uh, containers. And so definitely a symbol of abundance. But again, you know, what would happen if, you know, these weren't in that lush green landscape, you know, can we, uh, still have the spirit of the Camino persist, uh, despite that landscape. And, and this is my attempt to say, yes, that that could still be the case. Another is all the various, um, uh, hay bales that we see on the landscape. I took so many pictures of these things, uh, in their natural landscape. I, I found the geometry of them, uh, very interesting the way the sunlight played upon them. And then to put them in this kind of context again was was very interesting for me. So 
another area that you may have seen on my map is um, the um, image of anima rising. And so uh, anima and animus are terms that are used to describe uh, different unconscious sides of the masculine and the feminine. And basically anima is, um, for me, and it may not be entirely correct from a, a Jungian perspective, Jung is the, the, the psychoanalyst who came up with the term. Um, but basically for me, it represents strong women and, um, and also the, the potential for men to have that same, um, feminine side as well from, from a point of strength. And I think for me, this was important because one of the most profound things I discovered on the Camino was, was the, the feminine energy on the Camino. Um, when I started walking Camino, I, um, became friends with a couple of very, uh, strong women, one of whom on the call today, uh, became my Camino Amigas. But just generally, I, I was so impressed by the number of women walking by themselves and their strength and resolve in, in doing that. And I spent a lot of time on the Camino talking about the way we, as a society, American society, look at women, treat women. And a lot was going on back then, uh, Me Too movement, uh, Supreme Court nominations, et cetera. You, know, <laughs> you don't have to pick a specific time to think about when this becomes an interesting topic but definitely part of what I was looking at. And so, um, a lot of my themes had to do with just the, the feminine energy and, um, how that could work. Um, so, so here I'm going back to the, the church, uh, in Villar de Donas in, in Galicia. And, um, this is the one you saw just last that had the, the, the waves rolling through it, but. As I mentioned, this church is a beautiful church. They have restored these uh, frescoes, murals that are just beautiful on the inside. And I had a great time there. I, as I told you, I went off Camino a few kilometers to see it. Uh, there was a guide there who gave me the tour in, in uh, Spanish, uh, the art history tour. <laughs> and I was impressed because by that time, my Spanish was good enough that I could uh, actually understand most of what she said and engage in the conversation. But just a beautiful church, a uh, whole range of these murals that I can't even represent here entirely. But basically what I did with, with these was I, I took those images and they had restored these murals and I sort of went through a, um, a process of thinking, what if when they were removing, restoring these murals underneath that they found some other things? Uh, perhaps first going down one layer and finding things more visceral, uh, you know, from the human perspective, uh, human images, organs, et cetera. And then if they dug down deeper, they would actually go beyond the human aspect of it and down into nature and really just understand the nature of things. And so this was towards the end of my Camino and was starting to feel, um, everything pulling together, but really the the power of nature was one of the things that came across. And so this for me was a way to sort of represent the, the symbolism of, uh, of the religious aspect of the Camino, but also try to drive deeper into something that, uh, predates Christianity and just, uh, celebrates nature. So another important area that, that um, for me on the Camino was Cristofero, very, uh, powerful point, very emotional point for me. Um, and, uh, basically again, looking at it from, from different perspectives and I had, uh, you know, many people bring a rock with them, uh, to the Cristofero and leave it there, but also people write notes and letters, uh, talking about, uh, their concerns recognizing loved ones, et cetera. And so that, that was a part of my experience also. Um, one thing I had done was, um, I spent a lot of time walking the Camino and thinking about, um, 
viruses, <laughs> not the not the virus that we used to COVID, but actually the the uh, the AIDS virus uh, back in the eighties. And um, I was just uh, a youngster back then, just coming out, and um, didn't get too much involved in that. But on the Camino, I spent lots of time thinking about um, you know what I could have done, what I should have done. Um, and so I, I wrote down some things to really commemorate that, but, um, I thought about the different people that I'd known. Um, and that was sort of my, my image here. So, um, basically celebrating that in these, uh, images. And then, um, here's a picture of the rock that I left there. And then also another image of the Crucifero as well. But, uh, again, just, uh, really wonderful, um, visit their beautiful place and uh, great memories for me with that. So the final thing is, is uh, the whole aspect of uh, how does this pull it all together in terms of my 70s music and my themes. And uh, those of you familiar with the song Woodstock by Joni Mitchell, but um, performed by others. Um, as I started to try to draw lessons from the Camino, I just really felt that, um, you know, we are all stardust. We all, all have something in common and we're all trying to get ourselves back to the garden, garden of Eden, wherever that might be. And so, um, one of the things that before I even went on the Camino, I read about that I was just fascinated with was the fact that, um, early pilgrims would use the Milky Way as a guide um, for the Camino. Um, and there was actually um, a legend that the Milky Way was the dust from pilgrims that was strewn up in the air and landed in the, in the sky. Um, so I was really just fascinated by the whole Milky Way and the stars thing. So I spent uh, a little bit of time uh, just focusing on taking those images and putting stars in back of them. Uh, the landscapes, you know, the hay bales, uh, putting uh, stars in back of those, and the landscapes itself. And then again, going back to my selfies, um, instead of walking on the ground, walking on the stars themselves, and and then putting the star field inside my uh, my Camino shadow. So to sort of conclude, um, that was, you know, Martin's wild and crazy Camino, uh, inward road. But, um, many of you may have picked up different prayers and things at different churches along the way. And I remember picking up something called the Beatitudes of the Pilgrim. And I read that and it sounded great. And, you know, I put it away and kept it, but just last week, actually, we could go today. Um, Lori Florence, who's on the, the call, I think, right now, uh, and I finished up the Camino de Sonoma. And uh, so it's a 75 mile walk from Mission Sonoma to Fort Ross on the Sonoma coast. And Lori leads a beautiful pilgrim ceremony there at the end, shell ceremony. And uh, she read some of the Beatitudes of the Pilgrim. And I went home and lay, looked it up, but having been on the Camino now, time being passed and having processed things. A couple of these just really have so much more meaning now. Uh, blessed are you pilgrim if you find that the journey opens your eyes. Uh, blessed are you pilgrim if you discover that the true Camino begins at its end. And blessed are you pilgrim if on the Camino you meet yourself in silence and silence is rich with prayers and prayers are encounters with God. So those just really stood out for me from the, uh, the shell ceremony that Lori had last week. And I thank her for that very much. So that is my story. And I really appreciate everyone, um, attending and listening. And, uh, if there's any questions, I'm glad to take those. If not, I'll turn it over to Guy.
everyone. I think you were on mute for a second. Okay. Okay. Am I back? All right. Yes, we invite anyone um, who would like to come forward. You know, I, I think uh, if anyone has any comments or any questions, please feel free to raise your hand and we'd love to hear from you. I know there's a, a, a lot of wonderful comments that are streaming in through uh, the chat there, Martin. Um, but we do invite everyone to share your thoughts or any questions you might have. And again, you can raise your hand. You can bring yourself off of mute. And perhaps uh, uh, perhaps people are, are sort of maybe um, how I am feeling personally right now is taking it in, Martin, I, I feel like um, having some moments of silence for, 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 for reflection, to be honest. Well, again, thank you, everyone. I, I really appreciate your time. That means a lot to me. And this has been very helpful for me moving forward. So uh, at the end of the month, I'll have my my big test with the live audience. First time I'll be speaking in front of a live audience since the pandemic. So it's another challenge. Well, you got about 39 fans here that I would be rooting for you and sending positive vibes your way. And I think I will echo the comments that are coming in here is that it seems like you don't, you know, it seems like you just have done this. I mean, it, with great energy and great thoughtfulness, but you have it all very you know, <laughs> come across to me very polished about it all. So, uh, for what it's worth, I think you'll do excellent, excellently. Thank you. All right. I'll I'll ask again if there's anyone that'd like to comment verbally or make any comments or feedback for Martin. Martin, hi, this is Marula. Where are you making the live presentation? So the live presentation's at the, uh, the gathering in uh, North Carolina, uh, oh, place, okay. Black Mountains. Yeah, so I think there's 250 or 300 people registered for that. So uh, yeah, it'll be my first gathering. So I'm very excited. Excellent. Martin, one of the things that really struck out at me, if I can jump in and, and take up some time here, is um, really resonated with me on uh, the part you're covering on just the transient nature, transient nature, this ephemeral condition, you know, of everything. And I was picking up that you're juxtaposing that against the Camino and was like, it seemed like the endure, you know, the kind of endurance of the Camino. And if just wondering if if I had picked that up, if that was something that you were kind of playing with on, you know, which to me that that was probably one of the first Camino lessons that I that I learned and I have to relearn and relearn is just that things are temporary. Things are, you know, the good and the bad and people that you meet, they're fleeting. And so particularly with people that I saw that were just coming in and out. And I remember in Burgos when it was a dissipation of like the Camino family after two weeks and it was just such a hard time to kind of carry on and it was really just again an example of how you know cherish that time that you have because you might not have it tomorrow and everything passes the good and the bad but I saw that kind of with your I think putting it against the Camino itself and kind of the enduring nature of it and I'm just wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, absolutely. And it had to do with sort of the personal nature, like you mentioned, but probably m most comforting for me as a lesson was, you know, I went into this because I was concerned about the politics and the time, you know, think about 2018, um, you know, nature, all these kind of things and walking the Camino and getting absorbed in the history of things, you know, pilgrimage of people walked for 1500 years made me realize that, you know, Spain's not been this paradise for the last 1500 years. There's been, um, you know, the crusades, there's been, you know, Franco, there's been, you know, world wars, 
whatever. And despite this, you know, things move on and the spirit moves on. And so that, that was comforting to me to realize that, you know, things may not be perfect, but that's just, just the way life works. And, uh, kind of coming to that realization was, was a good lesson for me, very profound and ultimately comforting. Uh, so yeah, just the whole thing of time and history. Thank you, Martin. Martin, um, uh, this is Emilio. Um, I want to say that your, um, your, your story, your, um, your personal experience, uh, is, is obviously yours and you've done it so, so richly, but it, it isn't just your story because you've, you've, you, I think you've touched a number of us, myself included, uh, so that, you know, your story is, you know, has characteristics that are your own, but you've also generalized it in a, in a way that it's, um, that it's, it's recognizable, um, and it, 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 it resonates in, in, in me. And I think in all of us that, that you've, you've, uh, you've been able to capture something about what the Camino means in a, in a, in a universal way, you know, so that, you know, we each can add a little bit more or differences, you know, to, to what our experiences are, but, um, it's the, it's, it's that. It's that commonality, you know, that uh, you've touched on. And I think, uh, I think you'll be, uh, you'll be doing more of that at the gathering in North Carolina. So I, I, I look forward to seeing you there too. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Mila. Morton, this is Mike Noel. Uh, good to see you. Uh, I loved your presentation. And, uh, one thing that struck me was your, um, your idea of the Camino rhythm. And I had forgotten that, that, you know, when you first get going, it's all, you know, packing and did I bring too much and all that. And then you get into the stride, this rhythm that just makes it very freeing. And then you're in with just the footsteps and your own thoughts. So, um. I, I liked that uh, you didn't have any pictures of the crowded bunk beds, and <laughs> the food or all the other things, but you, you made it, I know you spent a lot of time on those, those, uh, pictures that you made. So I was very impressed. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Any other comments out there? You got a comment? Mm -hmm. Okay, Anne. Hi. Hi, Anne. <laughs> Martin, thank you so much. It was just so beautiful in so many ways. I also was so taken by those structures that I just kept taking pictures of these structures, which then ended up, I learned, to be those grain storage buildings. And I would just see them in different shapes all over. And it was like, what are these beautiful structures? Just so simple. And um, then I learned meaningful as far as, you know, storing grain. And so anyway, I just really enjoyed this. And thank you again so much. Thank you, Anne, for the comments. Appreciate it. Okay. All right. Martin, I don't even know what to call them, but I love, I love the whole thing. But those pictures, they were just, um, you know, you just black and white, almost like beige and white. And you had one and then you kind of softened it. That's right. The pastels maybe at the beginning. That was so beautiful. I'd like that name of my well. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting because I found that the, the less detail I had in the image, the more powerful it felt to me. Like, yeah. Is that, that's like, correct. Yeah. It's my memory and my feelings as opposed to my visual recollection of it. Yeah. It was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. One other thing that pops to mind, Martin, I really enjoyed 
Um, it's very intriguing. Everything was intriguing and very thought provoking. And it really made me, you know, want to go into a spiral again of just reflecting upon my own experiences. Now that I've seen a way to interpret experience that you've shown us. Um, but your concept of a building and then the layers and layers of history and trying to kind of, you know, un unveil them as you go layer and layer down is just was very cool, very cool to think about. And it made me think of just sometimes when I'm out walking, even here in the Bay Area, and I just try to think of if I'm looking at a scene and going back in time and the different layers of human history and flora and fauna that have come through over the years and the layers and layers of it and to see how, you know, you were reflecting that in a building that you saw um, was very enjoyable. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. All right. Well, I'm sure if um, any thoughts or any further reflections or questions, Martin, would you be open to um, letting people get in contact with you perhaps? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Okay. Um, if there's a preferred method of people getting in contact with you, Martin, feel free to, to drop it into chat or we can follow up with people after the session here. Um, but with that, I would like everyone, if you can join me just in a round of applause, whether visually in your camera or through your reaction tools and your Zoom tools down there. Thank you. But uh, what a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And I can just say it was, I, I feel like I'm echoing everyone on just, it's just a unique and inspirational, evocative way uh, to spend the evening. And almost in so many ways, I, I didn't have, you know, one of my other Camino lessons about cautioning and expectation going into anything, but it was just a wonderful surprise and a gift that, you know, um, that you provided. Uh, so thank you very much for sharing us and previewing it for us.